Thanks, Barbara. <clears throat> I have a title for this evening's conversation, which is a play on Lee Lozano's famous statement, win first, don't last, win last, don't care. The title is, paint first, don't last, paint last, don't care. With this, I have a number of questions in mind, uh, which can take the conversation in different directions. Firstly, the 1960s, 70s, from which Lozano emerged and subsequently disappeared, represents the idea that everything is allowed. And yet, somehow, painting in that time was not, keeping in mind that so many of the conceptual process and, that's loud, and earth artists and many film and video makers and performance artists had begun their lives in art as painters, as studio artists. Painting was, by artists, critics, and curators, looked down upon. It was retrograde, it was not advanced, it was on the market. The post-studio artist was the vanguard. One question I have is, so that's the 60s, 70s. Can artists today paint or unpaint and not care? But to be careless doesn't imply indifference. It suggests a particular engagement to consciously do as you please, to be free. This was also an idea behind the post-studio 60s and 70s, part and parcel of the politics and liberation of that time. It's going to be over in a minute. To, be, to ask painters, to ask of painters today, what is their investment, is to raise a parallel question. In a world that emphasizes winning and losing to such an extent, far beyond the criticism of art in its markets and of museums in Lozano's time, is painting today equated with winning more so than any other practice. And if Lee Lozano came back as an artist tomorrow, would she stop again? I, if I asked that question, I think the answer is she would. <clears throat> would, the, but would the reasons be different or in any way the same? Freedom is at the heart of it. So I thought to start, uh, that's kind of a lot to put out. But, uh, um, do you, whoever wants to go first, recall or remember the first time you saw Lilo's on the work, encountered it, and? I saw it first, and uh, maybe I saw it before, but I first might took real note of it. It was in um, David Reed's exhibition uptown of um, this group of painters who were you know, in, painting in the 70s, more or less. I forget the name of the exhibition. Thank you. Uh, what, what is it? High times, hard high times. High times, hard times, yeah. And there's also a, a, an article in, from 2001 Art Forum uh, where Katie Siegel, um, and I think the show was around that Katie Siegel interviews data read about Lou Lozano specifically, um, which is really great article. Um, but really, more, it's just, since then, it's just been more and more emergent. Um, but it's very possibly, I saw it in the early 80s when I was living in, in New York, and, uh, you know, but maybe not. I don't know. It seems like perhaps uh, there, there, there was no opportunity to see her work as late as 1982. Right. I mean, well, I, I have not seen the Lozano's work, but I got introduced to it as a concept. It as an idea and in relation to my own painting practice and I got introduced to it by you in the 90s and it was through it was not so much about like actually looking at paintings or seeing the paintings or being interested in the objects but into procedures that would enable any kind of um, creative acts and as a, as a female artist in the city of New York. And for me, it was one of these interesting and kind of antagonistic um, propositions about painting and the failure of painting and returns <coughs> and painting in relation to social um, scenarios and interactions and how dependent and interlaced these 
type of productions and these positions were. So for me, it was a very crucial sort of um, package and not, I would never be able to separate and I would also refuse to separate a painting, the, the painting production from her other like decisions and other um, other types of output or in, or the drop out output. Right. So for me, of course, coming here and seeing this is a, a highly problematic <coughs> proposition about Lozano. Like in a way, just compacting it into um, a package of paintings and drawings. On the other hand, said that I would be interested to. Uh, interesting, interested in a discussion around like why are we trying to um, package things in this way? You know, like why is it obviously is is a rediscovery or reevaluation of an artist always necessarily um, related to a kind of um, a, a retro kind of packaging? You know, or a kind of or is that is it necessary maybe for a formal analysis or for whatever analysis to 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 make these um, parts? No, there's not. There's but not. That's what, but that is something that like, you know. Is it is it a, an entire like you know? Is it something to, that needs to be discussed in its entire? Well, there's not one Lee Lozano. There, it, you know, yeah. artists have multiple lives. If they have long careers, and actually her careers. And, that long, but it moves at such a quick pace. It's really, there's a lot of speed to how she moves from, you could say, part one, her earliest period, to tools painting, which is the second period, to, you know, there's a big drawing uh, activity. There, there's this art, which is maybe three, then there's very conceptual work, which is four, and then there's leaving New York and no longer producing art, which is five. But so, I feel like the way it's come, uh, you know, been revived, so to speak, this is our last piece, even though it wasn't the last phase in that progression. <clears throat> you know, my, the first I ever heard of her was really you know, hearing about the conceptual pieces, and supposedly, uh, you know, the only artwork of hers that is ever mentioned was ever mentioned in obituaries and such were, were some of her conceptual pieces, mm -hmm. for instance, the not talking to women piece. You know, which is, uh, she's more notorious for that piece. Than she is known for painting, really. And in, in that, uh, you know, and perhaps that's equally problematic to sort of take that out of context and package it. Um, but, you know, it's, I think, it, you know, the, the vision of art, what artists do, as presented by museums and galleries, is often completely a misrepresentation. You know, it tries to take something that seems unified and, you know, that has authority. And, presented as like, well, this is what artists do, when actually most artists I know are doing many different things at the same time, or in different phases of their career. But, um, so, you know, this is a classic painting drawing show, but enriched by, the more you know about her, the more enriching, enriching it is. I think, I think when you look at it, any work of hers, she's such a strong figure that everything she did and everything she stopped doing, it's there, you're aware of it. Um, and even if this is a show that's just a drawing show, obviously every show can't show you the whole breadth of what an artist does. But what I come back to is how, and it goes to the opening remarks, in a period when 60s, 70s, when people stopped making paintings, started doing other things, post-studio things, um, very conceptual things, people making works that were not physically realized and so on, why is she painting? It's obviously something important to her as a practice. And I think that's also something common to both of you. Uh, you know, one of the things that really struck me, um, there's a drawings book they have here, and there's a quote from April 1969. And she says, and maybe this goes towards answering that question I just put out there, why is she painting when she she could have done anything. She could have made sculpture. She could have done, you know, um, any number of things. But there is this painting practice. And she said, <clears throat> painting is the most extreme transformation of homely, ordinary, cheap materials into an, extra into an extraordinary eye and mind-pleasing 
vibrating slab of abstract matter. Um, so I think she was interested in the possibilities of what could be done because it's, especially it's, two D, it's 2D work, but she's an artist who's interested in physics, science, math, astronomy, all these things. And then she makes these paintings that kind of defy our idea of how you represent things like light moving through space. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that they correspond to most people's expectations of painting in that time, nor this time. And they're not really visual at all, you know, the way the, the, the sort of visual cues of the paintings are very few. You know, they, they do something else. But I think to answer your question, like, that's, that's yeah, she saw a possibility or things she wanted to do in painting, but, but because, like, she seemed to radicalize everything she touched, um, she wouldn't want to paint because people told her not to. I think this is really that simple. I mean, I, you I would even say that you came out of a period where somehow painting, you weren't supposed to paint. And then out of that came a very interesting group of people who just said, okay, we'll just use painting in different ways, that it became part of a bigger practice that, uh, you know, if you think about the 80s, it was a very different return to painting, especially if I think of like, I mean, you're coming from Cologne, you had Mark Kippenberger, you had Michael Kreber, you had a lot of people who were, Charlene von Heil is here, who were not making works that were somehow, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, but allowed. I, yeah, but I do think that's what I mean by, by certain, um, developing a certain sort of haltung or an attitude, what painting is supposed to do for you, or you do with it, or with this act of painting. Because it is, and I don't know, I can't speculate on, on how Leo Zander did her paintings, but from the, the, the moves she has made, like from in retrospect, like from everything seems to be also this kind of decision, like to push like one particular type of work and her, her particular desire and interaction with that, like be it like this super tight um, kind of weird feels that she disappears in here or be it these aggressive, active like conversation pieces that are the, the screws and the tools. Everything is this is, is a sort of a is like going high intensity and with a certain speed and 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 kind of um, uh, duration and also sort of I wouldn't say carelessness but a kind of um, She's not like she doesn't try to be reliable, reliant on anybody or anything. It's like this, like this little. Um, and I think that is some way of like how to make painting at this at the moment when maybe painting and other people like isolate it in a way from the discussion and make it your platform, your thing, and let's go full force with it, you know, wherever it takes you, and of course you run into, yeah, um, walls or, in, 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 but you risk that, and, and so I think that is sort of her, her, her whole thing is a sequence of taking that risk, you know, and, and so I think that's, that's that what is interesting to me about it, like that somebody is, is in a way, almost like maybe knowingly that this can also cause your yeah. Like when you when you look at drawings, you look at uh, drawings where she's imagining I can make this painting or that or why don't I try this or do that. You see in the margins that she's actually talking back to herself and saying she's rejecting a lot of her own ideas. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of paintings that only exist in drawings that she never made. It was just. So I think even she understood there was a kind of failure implicit in really trying to go beyond what is, you know, this humble materials, this two-dimensional plane, etc. But, but I think it was all wrapped up with a, a very conceptual approach, you know. Um, that was very, like, you know, for instance, the way of paintings, which are the paintings that came after these paintings, um, you know, the way they proceeded was very sort of measured, very deliberate, as these paintings are. And, um, um, you know, essentially, the when because they're like the first one has one way, and then the second one has 
to her. It, it proceeds mathematically and got to the point where she couldn't physically do the paintings anymore. So they, yeah, the they last painting, the last painting. Conceptually, the series continued by virtue of its ideas. Its idea would be infinite, so it's that she reached the physical limit of what can be done with painting itself. So I think just, you know, I think she used painting also as it's just another sort of way to sort of project her, her, her activities as an artist. Her, and her, and she was just ceaselessly questioning um, what she was as an artist, what is an artistic life, or, you know, it was very, uh, you know, which very restless person, yet she could settle down and, 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 and uh, you know, paint paintings with great intent and intensity, uh, and that didn't seem to her to kind of like, um, it was not a disavowal of her rotten status. It's interesting to me to think about the artists that she interacted with when she was in New York in that time and working, for, she stopped working before, while she was still painting. And they're mostly, uh, well, they're mostly men, but they're mostly sculptors and people doing things with language, you know, uh, Richard Serra, uh, Carl Andre, uh, Dan Graham, and so on. And I feel like there's something very sculptural about, if you think about it, from the tools, which are the actual implements that sculptors use, hammers, things like that and drills and so on, um, and she's representing them, and then she goes beyond that to representing things like cones and various forms, and, um, you know, it's a very sculptural, even when you look at the surfaces of them, and you realize it's a kind of raking of, um, uh, and she's not really interested in tactility or texture, it's, that's, becomes in a sense, I made a note about that, something from 1965, when Jill Johnson talked about the ridge and the groove surface, that's called ridge and groove surface, the painting, the furrowed surface, um, it relates to this idea of tools, metals, hard things, you know. It feels almost like, like I feel like the painting almost made with like, with the brush is like a, it like, like a like group of styles or something, you know, like a ring, like a beer, like it's sort of, everything is about this hardness. It's another aspect of the work which, I mean, people talk about, which is that it's so masculine. Again, when I talk about her, the artist she's engaged with. And I never knew what that meant. <laughs> but there's masculine painting and feminine painting. But, well, there's paintings of drills and screws. Yeah, but men painted also men painted yeah. women, and that wasn't like feminine painting, you know? No, but what I mean is that she was, she is a person, is men, I'm not saying, Women's art looks like that. I'm saying right. Lee Lozano's art looks like it has a kind of toughness and it's violent yeah. and it's, you know, and her whole identification is male. Uh, yeah. You know, and even in some of the drawings, the way that she's writing, it's a male's voice, it's a man's yeah, voice. Isn't, you know, isn't he, that like a symptom of its, of its time or of its... Or, I think it's, it's a symptom of her. It's also a symptom of a lot of lady artists, you know. I mean, that they cannot tolerate being lady artists. Yeah. I mean, it's like a self-hate thing also, of course, you know. I mean, you see it in, in artists today as well. I mean, I see it all the time, you know. I mean, I think this kind of, and then pushing against, like, like rejecting, in a way, the, the, um, the insignias of whatever, f what female <laughs> could mean by overcompensating it to this other, like, over-aggressive, over, like, you know, evacuated. Of, I mean, I, I think it's much more, it's a problem of not dealing with any kind of emotional material in herself. Like, I mean, it's like, the work is extremely non-sensual. Like, it's so hard, it's like really rough sex. It's like, ugh, no, it's like all the time really, um, it's yeah. brutal, you know, it's, it's very hard and it's super desperate, I yeah. think. I mean, there's this unbelievable force in, in, in this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's got a lot of shape, you know, and humor. I feel like, I don't, I don't really see no, this sort of like, no, I yeah, see this painting, like she's, she's, she's playing with us, she's playing with herself. No. And like, with, like so much of the other work is full of cheek and humor. And I don't see why suddenly, oh, abstraction, where well, we can't let in that part, you know. 
It's not, that's a pencil. I'm sorry. It's a pencil. You know, but it's not. It's also an abstract painting, and it's like uh, it's it's a, like it's a very large thing. But it's like someone like sitting there, like making her drawings. She's making a painting for herself, making a drawing. And, and I think this is all very conscious. And and, and and yet, you know, about the emotional dimension, I don't think it was her failure to deal with her emotions. So it may have been, but it also was very much like in the conventions of the time to to sort of banish those aspects from art and. And there was very much about her that was solidly interested in the mainstream. I think these paintings, for all of their sort of um, radicality, are also like dealing very directly with very mainstream things in American painting, like mass. It's not, you know, post-war painting is just much more about mass than it's about life. That's distinctly American. So, I, but I, I, I don't know, I choose to interpret that she is very conscious of these things, but, you know, there's so much that's missing from her notes and writings about her life, for instance, okay, you see allusions to, you know, maybe the reality she was living daily as a woman artist in the 1960s, but yet nowhere is there any kind of like complaining or mention of discrimination against her, and maybe in a drawing over here will be this sort of like sarcastic aside about something some guy said to her, or sex or something that, that comes across, you know. Do you understand what? There's a, a, another quote of hers that I think is, is important and really central to who she, how she saw what she was doing. And she said, one thing I always liked was the idea of energy that is not contained by the edges of the canvas. And, you know, you brought up the way of paintings and I know your practice here too. And I think there's, you know, today it's very easy that people refer to a kind of performative aspect to art. I think it's, I, I, I think uh, there's not a lot behind it. But with Lozano, she was really interested in this very physical, very durational engagement with what she was doing. You know, the last wave painting uh, she worked on continuously for 52 hours, and that's not taking a nap and going, you know, that's being up for over two straight days to finish a painting, and that's the end, because it's not possible, you know, the next painting would have been an even greater uh, engagement of just time and energy, there was not what a chance of making one. You couldn't physically fit any more waves into uh -huh. the space, I mean, and I guess it was part of the work that, it, it's, that each painting is the same exact uh, side of the and I wonder if that's something, that kind of engagement with like sort of performance, that not just the performance like I'm making this painting, but that the painting itself has to perform. And that also relates to why painting isn't just this kind of, uh, you know, passe or obsolete thing, that it has potential to yeah, but I be, think be put out in public and have some kind of function. Yeah, but the the more obsessive you become about your painting in the studio performance, which is a performance, I mean, if, you know, um, um, the, the less you sort of have to deal with the other performance, which is the rest of all the stuff you do as an artist, you know. I mean, you do, there is a social performance all the time, and I think Lozano was very aware of that too, but the, there was no, there was, Absolutely, this is a different era. This is the 60s. This is not the 90s. It's where when we had a conversation about Lozano and, and her like conceptual pieces and her studio pieces. And it's not now, it was not like it is today where everything is basically informed by social performance all the time, at any moment, you know, even when you sleep. So I think. Um, she did not want to reconcile these. I mean, there's this one, there's the, the extreme studio performance, and then there is the other social performance that also is pushed to an extreme, because I guess she, I, I don't know why this is like this, but she, this is maybe because of her personality, or that's her contribution to keep these things apart, to not mix them up, or maybe it's she couldn't, or whatever, but they dif distinctively almost like running against each other, or like they're, they're two things that can't mix, and that's 
in a way interesting also. You know, it has very sharp edges, so to speak. There is no, in a way, the paradigm of endless communication and endless negotiation and endless exchanges, it hasn't really settled in at that point, not yet to a degree as we do it today. So it's very, for us it's of course very hard now to, when we use the term performance or performances or performative aspects of painting and try to conceptualize this, it's, it's a very, you know, we, it's very complicated to, to use it in the same way as people in the 60s might have thought. You know, so it's, it, gets, it gets a bit messy. But I think with her, in her, when we look at the work today, and look, that it seems that there was a, a, a really, she recognized this as a super problematic terrain, and there was this extreme performance type things in the studio and there were these other also pushed to an extreme performance pieces that were social performance pieces. I mean that's how I see it and what, whatever, can, can we learn something from this, can we examine it, can we, I don't know, recognize your suffering or I don't know what it, you know, what, what to do with it today. It's complex, yeah. it's, it's, it is a problem and I think that is also interesting still poses that problem. Well, I think, I think you have to put into context and time also the emancipatory politics of the 60s, which are pretty, don't exist now, and the way things were defined in sort of camps and the narrow world were how they were defined according to the, you know, the radical politics uh, and activism of the 60s, and, and I think, you know, it essentially, I have this feeling with Leo Lozano amongst other artists, and, you know, I think all artists have encountered this, but especially painting like this, you know, in sort of post-minimalist time, <coughs> post-minimalism and conceptual art, like both are equally inadequate to the task of, of uh, uh, making art and life, life come together in an emancipatory way, you know, uh, not even to mention, you know, uh, reforming social institutions inside and outside the art world, you know. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of things people, people were talking about, and neither painting nor conceptual art, either on their own, were really, even at that point, doing that adequately, you know. I mean, she herself became, she made a piece out of no longer going to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, meetings, and she's basically boycotted, uh, you know, uh, the whole sort of reformist movement. Yeah, but for me, it still poses a problem, and I'm interested in the fact that it still poses a problem for me, that there is an artist that has a very specific, kind of interesting output in itself, strange like contradictions going on in, in the work itself. So I'm interested in that, and then this character is also, like in a way, um, one of his, one of the pieces is this total rejection of women, and I find that, you know, you can say this was like a kind of reaction to the times where, like, you know, it, it was it, you could read it as some revolutionary being more revolutionary than the revolutionaries or something like that. But I think it's still a position that is, in a way, unacceptable. Or it's like, I think it's. So it's a super problem, and I think at the same time, um, I, I would, I cannot look at the paintings and not have that in mind. Let's put it that way. So there is already a split happening. In a way, she introduced that split. She obviously wanted a non, a non-reconcilable, whatever um, uh, viewer. You know, like a. She wanted not admiration or explanation. She didn't want to be like fully accepted. Or so there is obviously a sort of a, a weird like force there that wanted us to struggle with this position. But would it would it have been less acceptable for her to not speak to men? In your opinion? Or no, no, no. I'm just I'm not saying I have a moral problem with that. That is, but I think it. it 
the, the potency of that kind of questioning that is in, introduced in, inside the work is interesting. And I wonder, you know, I mean... You know, a lot of that period she comes out of, people can look back on it and say, oh, it was all about testing limits. You know, what are the limits of the gallery? What are the limits of the, you know, so on? And I don't know that a lot of people really were testing a lot of limits because if you use Lozano as a sort of measure, and it's an extreme measure, uh, testing those limits, and even the conventions of the nice cities of being in the art world and other things and all that stuff, which she rejected, testing those limits kept pushing her all the way out beyond beyond art, beyond painting, beyond New York, beyond ever making anything ever again. So it's really the kind of climactic moment of what for some people is just, you know, it's almost might as well be in a press release about the 60s that we're testing the limits, you know. Um, I know that when she, before she left New York, uh, and I don't know if maybe even some of these paintings, some of these paintings that are in this room, I have no idea. Uh, you know, she emptied her loft and she just put the paintings on the sidewalk to be picked up by the garbage truck. And they only are here today because friends went and said, you know, they put her paintings out on the sidewalk. And they, they, they picked them up and they took them in. But for her, it was a casting off of, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's, that's really right. That sounds like a romantic tale. No, I think it's true. Because there's another story that says that she made sure that a certain amount of work was in a, in a storage bin. She had a friend. And she had a friend, like, taking care of it. So I don't, you know, I, I don't like these kind of um, romanticizing, whatever. Maybe she just um, put out the one she thought. Yeah, I don't think that's... It's impossible to know why she did anything, really. I think yeah. it's better to just look at, you know, uh, like how we receive those acts, you know, instead of trying to discover the underlying reasons, you know, like what, what is that, okay, what does drop out piece do, you know, what, what do these paintings do? Uh, especially, it's, it's like the more you dig in, the more mysterious the whole thing becomes. <laughs> especially when it's a world then and now that people want to drop into. Yeah. So even, I think you have that sense, you know, that it's a kind of an, ongoing antagonism uh, where if you drop out it kind of points a finger at everyone else like I know I reject what everyone else wants um. yeah I mean or what or more kind of thinking what these kind of um, attitudes of dropping out I mean mean today or is they indeed actually possible even you know mm -hmm. whether it's not in a way, just a, just a, another way to advertise in a way, yourself. Also, or that even like the, like these things, like re, the rejection of women. You know, I mean, it is. It's also. It, it it still these sentences are. They exist within um, within other artists. I mean. If you, if you hear talk like Isa Genskin about females, then it's like there is no female artists. There's only her, you know. And I mean that I find that weird, you know. And then it's like, well, is that part of the necessary sort of let's say anger to overcome the niceties of permanent exchange world? Is that the only way out to be that kind of either crazy or aggressive or in other way a kind of a dropout, like perform the dropout sort of attitude to the highest degree, you know, as that as a sort of a way of, you know, another way of commodifying yourself. Mm -hmm. Like isn't that the performance that we are all into these days? And so in you know and that is for me these uh, uh, um, the Lozano problem is for me sort of in a way a cipher for this type of still existing problem or like that has to change, maybe the circumstances have, have changed but the, the problem itself is still there. You know, and um, so that is, yeah. And I, what I find interesting though is that there is, it's unreconcilable. The work is like, uh, it is, and that's interesting. 
So as you're saying, saying that it always will sit very uncomfortably. Yes. In, yeah. In our gallery, and yeah. the way it's been curated here makes it look like it belongs here very safely and securely. I, you know, I think any individual could interpret that very differently. I mean, that, that is just yeah. to assume that a painting well, itself, a like, painting can be radical, or like a painting and drawing show that's like very formally related means nothing intrinsically. It's only in relation to these uh, these other acts, like her conceptual pieces, that this has has meaning. And, you know, and I, I, I just, I, I. I think it's like all the, you know, the paintings sort of penetrate the conceptual pieces as much as the opposite happens. And I don't see why like painting, drawing, part is this blank, thing, but everything else is like full of meaning. You know, I don't quite agree. I had a feeling that we would talk, you know, it's a painting show primarily and we would end up talking about everything else. And there'd probably be a lot of painters in the room that wonder, why aren't they talking about the paint? But that's a big part of Luzana, which is that she's always kind of in the room. And as I was saying earlier, there's more than one facet to who she is. And there's probably the one Luzana which dominates everything. And, I, and it's I, interesting that you can do that without being biographical, because she just made everything she did into an art piece, right? I think it actually really comes from her. It really is about this being. Uh, I can never get past one, something she wrote with, and I'm probably going to misquote it, but I don't think it matters too much. Uh, the, the sense of it is that she said, um, something like, I'm not angry, but I feel rage. And my thought is, I would rather deal with someone who's angry, because it's probably a passing thing. And then rage is something like a very intense emotion, which probably, you know, is, was there all the way through. When people look at things like the tool paintings, they might get this sense of a kind of hitting and a kind of violence and all that. And then when you get to these paintings, you might think, you know, that somehow this person passed through it all. But I don't think she did. I think these have a certain appearance, but it's still the same. It's the same person who made them. It's not like a different person came somehow with it. Because these also follow just a few years after that work. And that work follows just a few years after all the drawings where she's, there's a lot of language and she's, I mean, she's very, really aggressive and very sexual. Um, but again, I did want to, you know, bring up the fact that we probably would speak a lot about her, almost to some kind of uh, exclusion of talking about the paintings. But I don't think that that's no. Even but I the don't think we have excluded that because I do. I mean, I pointed it out different times. Like the, the underlying, what you call rage. I wouldn't call it rage. And maybe I call it she more force. Or she called it rage. Is visible. It's clearly visible yeah. in every, in, on the surface, in, 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 the, in the tightness, in the, in the kind of pressure, in the, in the more drawing type, like it's other work that is not on display. I would use so, on, so I do think it's, it's completely visible and we are, we are not, we are not kind of um, leaving that on the side and it's not like, oh, the, the acts of um, her conception, conceptual pieces are, more rage than the yeah. others. It's 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 distributed in, in in all the fields, and I think that is also the interesting part. You know that they kind of in a way seem to fuel each other. I, I can see it as a kind of form of self rule. You know, and her, her the way you know the way she made conceptual art, the way she made painting is like you, you know you sense her trying to sort of bottle the rage or whatever. You know. um, but that's what makes it all. Good and different from a lot of conceptual art of the era. You know, well, I think self rule is a good way of saying it because, you know, she did a piece called T Take Possession. And I forget which artist she was speaking to. And he was uncomfortable with it. And she's, you know, she said something like, We're all possessed. But of course, she 
to maybe a stronger degree. Um, but you to just picking up what you were saying a minute ago that these things, these emotions and so on, are visible, I would say, and again, speaking about paintings as paintings, it's even visible chromatically because it's a very particular palette. You know, when you get something that looks like a bright color, it's basically rust, this painting here. But I'm not sure where this came from, but I made a quick note before I left the house. I was reading some of her notes in this catalog, and I thought, you know, nobody really would think about Lozano in these paintings as a, like, in relation to the light and space artists. Everyone thinks of oh, all these sort of plastics in California and everything, you know. But I think she, it is a kind of, it is dealing with light and space, but she's like the light and space art, artist of darkness, you know. There's something definitely, there's an undertow. Because it's, it's a bad like that kind of interred feeling of the painting. I feel like they're buried in terror, like a, like a terrament, you know. Like they're buried alive or something, and they're so claustrophobic, you know. There's no air in them. Like there's light and space of objects, but there's no figure ground even. Part is an object or you know, suffocating the, every other and things object. collide. I mean, yeah. some of them don't make sense if you think about, you know, if you really want to think. Well, I think figure and ground, like yeah. how does something pass through three different panels but also three different spaces it's, and still maintain a kind of object that's yeah. coherent it's across all? They're all puzzle, they're all sort of puzzle. The same form does this here, and it's more else me all painting, and it does that really, but. Um, yeah, this is, I think, you know, this is something that does, is a sort of, like, I think it, painters have a kind of sensibilities, you know. Uh, I don't like, I don't think of this as style, I think it's a sensibility, there's just something, something that she wants to see in her painting, and she figures out a way to make it um, apparent, but, you know, there's, there's a, it's very much the same, feeling in all the paintings. You, you wouldn't call it formal painting, though. I've seen one or two people sneak out, so I think that's my cue to open it up in case uh, anybody would like to uh, uh, ask some questions or uh, raise a point. Uh, when did you make these? Sorry? 16. When did you make these? 64 to 67. Sixty-four to sixty-seven. No, I think these are a little late. Sixty-seven, sixty-eight. Just the wave series is sixty-seven to seventy. Mm -hmm. yes. That's what I. <coughs> Latter, any, late sixties. <laughs> any questions or anybody have any disputes or grievances? <laughs> Nobody. Yes. <coughs> What do you think it is about her that has made her work suddenly so relevant? I mean, people weren't paying this much attention to her back in 1967 or 1980. Why is it that suddenly people have I don't think it's up? I don't think it's suddenly relevant because, um, you know, she left New York, she stopped working. There were no galleries actively working for her uh, in her absence. Uh, it's a pre-internet era, so that's kind of, that's what you call the black hole of anonymity and so on, which, you know, looks good again. Um, and then slowly there were shows and then retrospectives and publication, you know, it's the usual process. The thing with Lozano is, in an emblematic way, I would say, is that as she's rediscovered, it really kind of ushers in that whole period when people, curators, yeah, lots of people wanted to go and see, oh, who was forgotten, or who can we bring back, you know, and, and that even became a certain, a kind of industry, you could say, who are the forgotten artists we can bring back, you know. Um, and, and, and David Reed points out in his interview with Katie Siegel also that it was like the, you know, everybody that started as a painter, but a lot of paint returned to sculpture. And so they naturally wanted to sort of promote that, you know. And then there were other people who just saw all painting as conservative. And so there was sort of a cutoff in interest of painting. Actually, it was a lot of, it was really mostly women who were making, who were sort of pushing paint for it. Mary Hollins in the room, for instance. Uh, you know, a lot like Dorothy Rocker and people like that, and Lee. And then unfortunately, this history.
histories are about loss because the dominant discourse became all about sculpture and other forms that, that, were, that were considered more grand. Like painting was just labeled as this old-fashioned. Old I would say, too, it's a matter of how there's a, a delay in what you go back for. So, for example, in the eight, late 80s into the 90s, people were interested in the 60s and 70s, what had happened just before. It's the way people create their own uh, view back to history, and it's the way that, like, young people today now seem to be interested in the 90s. Um, so I think it was just a certain kind of timing that made it right yeah, for Yeah, but, but the question is always, I think it's a very good question because, you know, whatever drives us to um, this, this in each generation, or it's not even generational at this point, it's, it's, it's sort of more, almost like an industry, of rediscoveries, so each rediscovery has its own agenda and has its own purposes. So, um, you know, you could also say, well, why wasn't she just rediscovered, like, together with what of the other minimalists, you know, because it wasn't workable, because somehow there was not enough work, it was too, whatever, difficult again, and too incoherent, or she wasn't. She could be rediscovered as performance artist. Uh, yes, she's not really because she's any not, of those things. She's so not that's really what I mean. Yeah, that's the, 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 it's not even. That's why I've, I'm. I feel it's in, it's an interesting position that even defies today this kind of rediscovery uh, imperative that everybody is like, like. You know, even the, the last forgotten whatever artist is being scraped off the bottom of some whatever, you know. That's just not true. No, but it is It is true insofar that there is an industry producing the, uh, these needs to, to feed the need on all the time. And I find it very interesting that in that field or in that kind of, um, um, you know, almost like reflex of, of that she is, she again, she is, she's like a weird, she's like a strange tank or something. <laughs> well, she created you can't, you problems. Can't really handle it, she created know? problems with her work and for herself in her lifetime. So yeah. the fact that such a strong uh, personality, like even death, doesn't end a strong personality's effect. Yeah, you know, I found that she's still creating a kind of problem for people. I, what I think is, is, uh, you know. For this work to have been rediscovered, let's say, it's about 10, 10, 11 years ago. Luckily, it wasn't five years ago, because then it would have been used to kind of prop up a whole sort of wave of really, you know, a lot of kind of mediocrity of the abstract painting from five years ago. And if she could come back to life, I can just imagine her seeing people kind of name-checking her, and she would just eat them alive, which would have been really fun to watch. <laughs> It's, yeah. al it's also a kind of like, it's also, it's also, it also makes, it, you know, it, it's like this work is some kind of connective tissue between today and when the paintings were made. And aside from the corrupting aspects of the market or whatever, it's how cynical one can be about, you know, reviving and repackaging the forgotten artists. And how, many, how many more of these are we going to have to go through? It, it does provide. <coughs> A, a more complete and a you know a clearer picture of like um, our time because it connects like, there are issues in these paintings that painters today are dealing with, for instance, or, you know, with all the conceptual work she did, you know, against like seeing these paintings in in the internet age it makes them function differently. But I think it's uh, like like I love this uh, Mark Marin podcast, you know. Which is because he's just talking to every single person who did underground comics or who was a stand up comedian and you know, who wrote a book about some oddball guy or something. And it just provides this, this sort of really complete picture of how all these people you know, interrelate. And I think it's important to talk about, you know, like the culture industry is being made not just by galleries, but artists too. And uh, you know, Lee Lozano had, had a role in that. Uh, so did Dan Grant and all the people that she knew, Carl and Drake. Um, and you know, I, I think it's, it's very clear that she she was sort of a troublemaker. You know, that she wanted to problematize some of the you know, more 
pious assumptions of that day and um, you know, it's disturbing some of her production as I think she definitely did that. Yes. These are coming into my head is that Duchamp um, can only make works which are not of art. They go in underground. Um, another thing is that they go on up, he's making the paintings, but they're uh, hammered to be hammered with a nail at the same time. I mean, there is so much going on in that period. And also, there's something sculptural about the fact that they're made in panels, and that means three things to be um, Painting, sculpture, etc. Yeah, like making a polyptic with uh, sure fires signifier. Not making, the Duchamp character. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's almost no insights into her identification or competitiveness with what else was going on around her. I mean, she's often mocking it or making fun of it, but she's doing that to herself as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's partly something that I think about where, you know, we can talk about the different kinds of work she made in different periods and how she stopped working and all this stuff. But at the same time, what maybe holds it all together is it's a person who's really using art to kind of see what she can do, where she can go. It's, you know, in other words, they're all tools for her, you know, not just the tool paintings. Right. And 
So maybe one of the reasons why people are still interested and will always be interested in Utah, as you're saying, but it's still a problem, is she's kind of asking in everything she's doing what it means to be an artist and to make art. And, you know, those are the big questions. Although, she, although not everyone asks. She's that. using the paint, yeah, she is using them, like, like, they have use, like, real use when art is not, especially painting is not supposed to have that. I mean. And that also goes to all of those drawings where we see all these paintings that she rejects, she doesn't make. There's probably many more paintings that she didn't make against what she did make which is, again, kind of a complete 180s, 80 degrees, I think, from this time. And there is a point those ones she did make, in a way, which isn't always the case, you know, because of the, the sort of general outlines for practice, I think. Do you think they're process-driven, or it's more of a pure abstraction? Well, the wave paintings are conceptual and process-oriented paintings, but that's one particular kind of penultimate group. Uh, and everything leads to them. I think, I think the process art is like you're experimenting with phenomenological pro properties of your materials and sort of discovering it. <coughs> I think all the paintings, like they're they're much more controlled than that. I don't think they're even. But I, I, I just I don't know, they're they're they almost really are like sculptures, like flat sculptures or something than paintings. I don't think that they're it's I would call them swirling here. Well that's a problem. <laughs> But it's there. It's there. It's part of it. Yeah. It's actually one of the best things about these works. It's sort of, let's maybe cheaper or uh, <laughs> materials and paints that she used, and it could even be you know, time and climate and so on. But there's a lot of, if you go and look up close, it's almost like you're looking at the lines in your hand. So the way, that's not something she painted, it's what's there today. But for me, it makes it more interesting to think about. I wouldn't want to see absolutely perfect surfaces because they're somehow all a little bit cracked. They all have, they've kind of come to bear under a certain pressure over time, which I think is what happens to people. Um, yeah, they've aged. Anyone else? Um, last chance? They're great, because they're I mean, because she was very physical. Against uh, Minden's room, which was, you send them to a factory and get made. But she's thrown her body into these. I mean, she's really physical, they really are about, you know, putting down her arm on the painting. Yeah. I, mean, they, I mean, as conceptual as they are, the, the conceptual style of them is actually saying she's not an Indian. She actually is putting paint around, and, uh, like, affirming her body in the painting. I see a lot of body in these. I mean, they're paint, but she's she's doing big degradations. I, I'm trying I'm trying to see them without the cracks. I love the cracks. I'm trying to see them how she did. Because um, I think actually they're very anti-interest in many ways. I mean, this is that that painting is not to me. It's not. It's like a composition. Yeah, actually, I like the first, and I like the as much, but it's too pictorial. But this one behind you, um, you, you can really see her, her, her power. I think she was very interested in power. And she likes saying fuck you to the minimalists. No, I mean, what, 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 what do you have to say? I'm, yeah, I'm not going to disagree. I feel like I left a comment somewhat related earlier about you know, not seeing the rage in them. Uh, I think that word is very strong. And again, it's her term. Uh, there's a hardness to them, which to me has something to do with almost the, if you think about the person and on a molecular level, there's a hardness there. Um, but I, you know, I kind of disagree with what you said about this painting and even what Jacqueline, you were saying earlier, this painting where 
representational, or you see, it. you know, to me, there's something that she does. Again, I go back to her interest in, you know, physics and math and astronomy, and I made a note, and I wasn't thinking about that painting, but I realized uh, that it relates directly to that painting, and I said that, you know, in her work, and again, it's something to do with violence and perform, that forms collide. But what I wrote is that she's trying to picture something that really you can't, you can't draw and you can't paint. It's basically time and space at this alternately expanding and contracting. And I think that's why you see in paintings things that actually don't make sense if you look from left to right, from panel to panel. And yet, at the same time, she's really moving through that space in what seems to be a fluid manner. Um, but, but she doesn't banish like the sort of volumetric modeling, you know. She like brings it in, but again, in a nonsensical way, more or less. I mean, I've seen all of the multi-panel paintings when they get put together and they're installed, and it's a very strange thing to see, you know, three pieces all of a sudden get hung on the wall one next to the other. It almost looks like it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. And then when it's on the wall, it tells you a lot about what the wall does, which is kind of creates a false order. All of a sudden, then you have to somehow accept it. Um, you know, I've come and seen this show a number of times, and every time I get stuck on the painting behind us, which it, I mean, I'm like, no, no, these probably were never meant to get, how did they end up together? Um, they're just put together because she put one next to the other, but it's still improbable, but you have to accept it. That's kind of what happens when you know, the most successful of all. Because it, there's no composition in it. But that one has a composition. I can't agree with that. But that's um, that's yeah, but that's it's because it's been put together. I think mean, the, the terms of this painting are just something like the negative shapes are it's just more of a sort of positive, positive negative flip flopping to take more. I think we have time for one last comment. Uh, I don't mean to put anyone on the spot, but whoever you are should be good. <laughs> Come on, you're all smart people. Yes, I see a hand. Thank well, you. I was just wondering about when she dropped out. Can you mention about what she ended up doing? Like, did she work a job? Like, did she write letters to people in New York? Like, she dropped out of making art. Or like, she wasn't she, making art. What was her daily life? What did she do? She just stopped reading. There's actually someone, I think, still here. Again, I didn't want to put someone else, but there's someone who here who knew Lee Lozano at the end of her life. Can you answer the question of not what she was doing just from day to day?
same time, the piece that Bob, that, that Bob was talking about is there's the trying to make a piece in which she throws every announcement that she got onto a pile in her, in her, in her, um, in her studio. So in her studio was a pile of all these announcements. And then when you're making it, she was in fact very aware of where she was in relationship with the larger part world and her colleagues. Then you threw your own announcements. When she closed the studio, the fact that pile went out the window. That's what that's what went out the window. Was all those announcements, yeah. which she considered a piece. That was. I wanted to say too that you know the dropout piece. Uh, it didn't just entail okay, I'm not going to be in the New York art world. I'm not going to make art. I'm leaving New York. She considered that that was performed for the entire rest of her life, and in fact, uh, it ends up being her longest consecutive piece, but when she was aware that there was interest again, she did not come back to New York, and that kind of separates her from almost any artist who's rediscovered, because they come back, many of them begin to work again, some of them pick up exactly where they left off, and she never, she never came back, and she never... Even when she was still anything. living in New York, I think she was asked to be in Documenta. Oh, really? Yeah, I think in 1983, I think it was, and... Uh, presumably, from what I read, her she contacted the curators and was like, "Well, what's in it for me?" <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then she didn't didn't end up agreeing to be in the show. Oh well, of course, I saw Duchamp. The April Day wasn't known until he died. Duchamp ostensibly dropped out. But he 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 lied about. He said he wasn't making work. No, he denied that he was making work. I think he avoided saying he was making work. I don't think he denied it. So it's another form of I'm just a big problem, it's okay. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it's the idea of, of going underground, not necessarily participating in the art. He was also an art dealer. Sure, uh, yeah. I mean, we could discuss, we could, we could try to remind it. Sure, that's fine, but... Um, I, I, why would I... But <laughs> but he was he's a right man. Avoiding being engaged, and it's okay if you're married to me, so what? Yeah, I just think like artists are constantly kind of like saying things that are kind of going to put people off course. But he didn't say. He it's didn't a different kind of underground, perhaps, but you know, Warhol is a portrait where he's. What he did was not to say, though. Ever? I, I always understood that he was. Well, between, like, okay, uh, between, yeah. between Lilo Sun and the shop, I want to say what keeps me from being in, invited off into art schools, which I think is a good thing to put out in conclusion. You think about the artists who drop out or stop, and I always say, it's always the wrong artists. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Barbara. Thanks to the gallery.